privilege to be with you uh, here this morning. Uh, today, uh, our next installment of Hot Topics, it's not going to get too hot uh, today. Uh, next week is the one where uh, I'll let Pastor Chris really uh, ramp up the temperature a little bit. So uh, uh, today we're going to talk about how to engage culture. Now, uh, I had a few college roommates, and uh, one of them was a chef. Uh, he was uh, kind of one of the line chefs at a local restaurant in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, it would always amaze me that we'd be sitting at the dinner table uh, and uh, together as roommates we would eat together once a week and we would, you know, kind of pass the food around family style trying to communicate that we were a family. And uh, every once in a while Will would, 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 uh, would grab a, a dish and, and set it next to me and, and then I would feel it and I would scream like a 12-year-old girl because it was hot. And I would ask him, hey man, how in the world did you just pass that over here without shrieking in pain? He's like, well, look at my hands. And he had like calluses and things from the restaurant that he had constantly handled hot things. Uh, and so his body physically adjusted. Now, I don't know if you know me very well, but my hands are very delicate, okay? Um, haven't touched a lot of hot things like that, right? And so for me, I need uh, the other strategy. I need very thick uh, oven mitts, right? I need the gloves. The, the girlier, the better, right? I don't care, right? I, I got to have the gloves to handle hot things, Relationally, uh, f like physically, uh, we also have our strategies when it comes to hot topics, right? Uh, in, in our household, uh, my family is, is from a little small town uh, in Kentucky, uh, and so I grew up uh, with Kentucky basketball as kind of a, uh, a second religion. Uh, and when you sit at our dinner table, there's a hot topic that you want to avoid at all costs. Do not bring up Christian Leitner at our dinner table, all right, because it goes really poorly for you, all right? I don't want to talk about the shot. I don't want to talk about really the 90s at all, all right, And so uh, until we get to the end. And so uh, there's always that hot topic. Maybe you don't know who Christian Leitner is, but you know what that hot topic is at your dinner table. Maybe it's not something sports related, but uh, everybody has the, the family issue, the thing that they're trying to kind of court around, they're trying to uh, avoid. Well, for us in the culture, there, there's also these, these topics, these hot topics. They're ever-changing. They're, they're ever-growing. Uh, they, they, they evolve. They shift. But what do we do as believers? Do we put on metaphorical oven mitts? Uh, do we just grow calluses as we get burnt over and over and over again? But today I want to propose a different strategy is we look to the scriptures that there's one other way that things don't get burnt, that, that you wouldn't get burnt. Hot things don't get burnt. When you set a hot thing next to another hot thing, they, they don't burn. And for us today, as we look at Paul in the scriptures, uh, for us as believers, as we burn, as we become hot uh, and reject lukewarmness in the gospel, as we burn for the things of the Lord, as we become hot and on fire for Jesus, we're able maybe to handle these hot things just a little better. Today I want us to see that hot topics are not to be avoided as the believer, but rather they are to be seen as an opportunity, an opportunity to talk about Jesus and make much of him. And so today as we look at Paul, as we look at the scriptures and his sermon today in Mars Hill, as he engages a culture, because hot topics aren't new, uh, that there's always been cultural hot topics, as he does it, we're gonna take five keys uh, to engage culture with the gospel. And so if you have your Bible, you mind standing with me as we turn to Acts 17. We've got a little bit to read today. We're going to read verse uh, in chapter 17, verse 16 through 33. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observed that the city was full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And some of the Epicurean Stoic philosophers as well were conversing with him. Some were saying, what could this scavenger of tidbits want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus uh, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. 
For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So Paul stood in the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation and mankind to live on the face of all the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his descendants. Therefore, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold, silver, or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere are to repent, because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man who he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to scoff. Others said, we shall hear from you again concerning this. So Paul went out from among them. But some men joined him and believed, among who were Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Father, I pray as we read this example of Paul engaging the culture with the gospel, I pray that we would uh, take a few things uh, from it. Lord, I pray that we would leave this place uh, determined to, to talk about you and not to shy away. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So five keys to engaging culture with the gospel. The first thing that we see there, uh, it quickly comes up in in verse 16, uh, is that we are to be provoked by the Spirit. You see, Paul is just waiting there, right, for Silas and Timothy. If you go just a little bit higher up on the page in the Bible, just in the text, uh, this really isn't a part of Paul's mission plan, right? This isn't mapped out. This isn't designed. This isn't on the agenda, Uh, There was no campaign email to to send out or or prepare. There was no mailers sent out or social media posts or uh, frequently asked question pages. He is just listening to the Spirit. You see, there's nothing wrong with those other things. But what had happened is in Berea, there was some trouble. uh, And he leaves Timothy and Silas there. And he moves on because they had a target on his back. And so he leaves them there and he moves on to kind of lay low and wait for them to catch up and resume the mission. But while he's waiting there, the spirit stirs because it's his, his lifestyle to listen to the spirit. Just a side note for us. I wonder how often we miss our opportunities to engage the culture because our days are just so chock full of our own agenda items that there's no room. You see, if it were us, if it were me, We would probably miss this particular opportunity. Why? Because we would be arguing with the Holy Spirit, right? Like it's almost like a high school debate team practice, right? We would be filled with questions like, what if this causes me to miss my rendezvous with Silas and Timothy? I'm tired from Berea and then Thessalonica, and so I need or deserve a break. What if something happens and we we can't make it to our next stop that we planned? We wouldn't want to miss what God has for us there. No, we'll just lay low. But what if for once, like Paul, what if for once you heard the Holy Spirit say something, do something, and you didn't say, ah, I'm not sure, but you just said, okay, I'm in, Lord, let's, let's see where this goes. You see, for us, we typically live for planned bursts of mission. Perhaps we, we can fit it in on a Saturday from one to three or on a random day uh, designated for sharing the gospel, which are all good things. But do we listen to the Spirit throughout the day where he would have us to engage? Are we prepared in season and out of season? Maybe we're missing the real missions that God frequently sprinkles in our lives. You see, most of us, and me included, our our connection to the Holy Spirit is is kind of broken. It's like a bad Wi-Fi signal, right? We've gotten so used to inaction that we've really become deaf and kind of atrophied when it comes to listening to the Holy Spirit. Conviction uh, and stirring of our heart becomes kind of like a white noise uh, behind the background of our busy schedule. But Paul here, he, he's just walking around the city. He's a tourist. But his emotions just aren't stirred by the, stirred by the beauty in the, in the, the, of Athens and the art like every other tourist. His heart is stirred by something else. 
the things that stir what? The heart of God. Not the things that Athens is just typically known for, but rather how well God is known in Athens. He sees idols throughout the city. Idols in Greek and Roman culture were kind of like Starbucks and McDonald's, right? They were just on every street corner. Athens was famous, what, for the Parthenon, right? You probably know that from history class. It housed the Greek god Athena, and 50 yards of that was the god uh, of Ares kind of housed there, uh, the Greek god of, of war. And so thus, uh, Opagus and Ares, Ariopagus, we see uh, the god of war there, uh, a little hill uh, on a hill. Some people instead uh, call it Mars Hill, which is, refers to the Roman god of war, instead. But Saul sees, Paul sees this, and he doesn't just sit it to the side. He can't just let it go. He sees the people have given the affections to something other than truth, and it doesn't sit right with him. Some translations use the word provoke. Others tell us it causes him distress. I, I like the word provoke here mainly because Luke, the author uh, of Acts, is using this phrase that would be familiar to the Old Testament readers out there. This is a phrase that would normally use, be used to describe God's reaction to his people worshiping idols in the Old Testament, that he was provoked to anger. And like God is provoked at people giving their affections to other things other than the one true God, Paul, as his messenger, his representative, is also provoked by the same things. Let me ask you a question. Are you provoked when you see unholiness? You see, part of our unwillingness to engage culture may be because we've become so callous to it, maybe even accustomed to it, maybe even attached to it, but not Paul. He can't say nothing. He can't just let it go. But it is important to know that Paul's here is a specific type of anger. His anger at the culture isn't because they are doing things that offend him personally, that, that make his life inconvenient or go against his preferences, He's not angry because they're just wearing the wrong clothes or he doesn't like how fast or loud their music is or, or he doesn't wear their hair the right way or uh, he doesn't understand some of the slang words that they use. His spirit is provoked because they are worshiping gods other than the one who deserves worship. You see, there are all kinds of things in life to be distressed with that are irritating. But do we reserve our, our provocation for the things that God is provoked by? And so for some of us, we're provoked too often. For some of us, we're provoked not enough. But would we be provoked by the right things? The people of God are always provoked by the things that go against and speak against the God they love. My favorite example of this is from the Old Testament. It's of David and Goliath. Uh, I don't know if you remember the story, but, but David kind of comes up on the scene, right? The whole army is there, and they've been taunted by Goliath this whole time, right? He's speaking poorly of their God, and David walks up and says, hey, what's going to be done with, with this man who speaks against our God? In the, in the response to the tribe, which would probably be our response too as well, they're going to be given fame in the, in the city. They're going to be given uh, the, the king's daughter. They're going to be given this, this stuff. They're going to be famous amongst men. And that's never enough motivation for them to actually act and confront Goliath. But what is David's motivation to confront Goliath? He is speaking against the God of our people, the one that I love. And this fuels him. This provokes him. This fuels him towards moving towards Goliath. How about you? Are you provoked by Anything? Everything? Has your heart become so callous that your, your, your idols, your spirit has stopped being provoked? Would you see God this week and ask him to provoke him, not for too much or too little, but for the right things? And so we see Saul's heart that he's provoked. And then number two, I think this is equally important to attach. Number two, a key that we learn in your notes, go where the people are in verse 17. The next thing we see in the text is what Paul's response is to being provoked. Right? He goes where the people are. He loved this. It's so simple, yet so profound. He goes to the synagogue and the marketplace. He goes to the place where he has some things in common with people, but he also goes to the place where he had hardly anything in common with the people. And as he begins uh, attempting to talk to them about Jesus, he begins to offer them a better way. But Paul's provoked anger at the offense of idols, it leads him to action. He doesn't just go home and complain about how, cult, how bad the culture is getting. He doesn't just tweet out a Bible verse about God's judgment. He doesn't isolate himself and pretend it doesn't exist. His anger leads him towards love. 
God's anger for idol worship amongst his people in the Old Testament, it stemmed from his love for them, that they would do what would actually lead them to true life. Paul, flowing from the God he loves, does the same thing. His anger stems out of his love for the people of Athens, his desire for them to worship the true God that would lead them to true life. The question, obvious question is, is that where your anger leads you? To love? You see, I didn't understand this until I had kids. I I have a son named Miles who one day uh, I come home and and, and I see him kind of over in the corner and and, and Kelsey's cooking dinner. Uh, No, actually she had left and Miles was in the corner and he was holding a liquid ant trap in his hand. And so uh, for me as a father, that's terrifying. I'm like, oh man, uh, there's chemicals in there. Like what's going to happen? I'm a new dad. And I say, Miles, and I scream, put it down. And as all good kids do, he stares at me and goes, closer to his mouth. My, my anger in that moment comes out, a louder scream, a more volatile scream, a, an immediate rush to take action. Why? Because I didn't love him? No, because I loved him, that my anger is provoked by my love for my son. You see, some of us are frustrated by the things of the world, but what it has led us to is to give up trying. We just see the news and go, wow, it keeps getting worse. And just keep watching. Our contribution to engaging culture is just to complain with like-minded people. But this isn't Paul's response. This isn't the godly response. Paul wants God to be praised as he deserves. And as John Piper says, missions exist where worship doesn't. So he goes on mission. He goes towards the people where they are, all of them, not just the ones that are most like him. And as we look at the character and nature of God, we see a God who pursues people. That he doesn't just sit back and wait for people to figure it out. He, sees, he sends his son to us while, while we were still sinners. In fact, we see him pursue people uh, all along. If this is the nature of God, then the one who is his ambassador, who has his spirit, who is being molded into his image, we must also pursue people. And not just the ones that are easy to love. You see, you can have all the right theology. You can have all of the right opinions. Vote for all the right candidates. But if your spirit doesn't love, then you've missed it. And it's not the spirit of God. We see this in 1 Corinthians 13. If you could fathom all mysteries of the world, but if you don't love, you've got nothing. If you give everything you own to the poor and surrender your own body to the flames, but you don't love, you don't have anything. If you had a faith that could move mountains, but not love, nothing. Luke 6 is one of the most challenging passages for me. In verse 32, it says this, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind and great un- to ungrateful and evil people. Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. You see, I-, I love how one theologian puts it. We don't just need the theology of Paul, but also his heart for people. Are you intentionally engaging non-believers graciously in your life? Are you spending time in a place where you know you will encounter non-believers, a specific restaurant, a gym, the workplace? No longer are the days where people will just casually step into a church because of a cool program or they were bored or they were looking for friends. We must go to them. Why? Because it reflects the nature of our Heavenly Father intentionally, not with a wait and see approach, but on mission to offer truth and hope. You see, God provoking always leads to loving people, to going where the people are. Paul's provoking leads to action not isolation. So we see, number one, we see the spirit provoke. Number two, we see him move towards the people. Number three, very simply, we see that he recognizes open doors and closed doors in verse 18 through 21. Now, uh, this is actually really complex. In life, I remember some open doors and closed doors that uh, I've missed. Uh, I remember in 2009, I was in college, uh, and a guy comes over to my house, and he sits down on the couch, and he's like, hey, man, I want to explain this thing to you. I'm like, okay, what, like, what is it? Well, it's called Bitcoin. 
And I'm like, all right, all right, man, like Bitcoin, okay, is it like, like, a, like, a, like a physical thing? Like, no, no, it's like, you know, in, in, it's kind of out there. I'm like, what? I, I don't understand. And he's trying to convince me that this is the new, the new way. He tells me, man, just, just, just give me $1,000, right? Give me $1,000 in Bitcoin. I'm like, that is the worst idea I've ever heard in my entire life. So obvious that was a closed door. And so, you know, you go and look up, you know, as of, I think, last year, if I would have invested that $1,000, uh, uh, it would be, you know, somewhere in the, in the $30 million range, you know. So uh, maybe it was an open door. I'm not sure. But this happens to all of us. It happened to Blockbuster when they were offered Netflix and, and on and on. But relationally, it's not quite that black and white, right? Relationally, it, it, it's not always that simple if, if something is a closed door or an open door when you're talking to people. Uh, we most often see this. Maybe uh, you can feel it more when it comes to relationships with the opposite sex. In fact, in fact I had a friend that I met with that got rejected by a girl the first 10 times that he asked this girl. And so everybody that he asked for advice is like, hey, man, that's closed door, man, closed door, right? So now they're married with two kids, and uh, clearly it was still an open door, but this sermon isn't about trying to explain women. That's not possible anyway. But recognition of when is the right opportunity and when is the wrong opportunity is super important when it comes to engaging culture. When do I speak up? When do I not? When am I wasting my time? When am I not wasting my time? And I'm not going to be able to give you some kind of really cool flow chart in this sermon uh, to help you make decisions or when to confront people and when to not. But I think the text does make one point that challenges us when considering what is an opportunity and what is not. You see, Paul is in the marketplace here, uh, and he's just striking up conversations with people. He's asking them questions. Often we're so concerned about having the right answers, maybe we spend some more time learning how to ask the right questions, right? He's talking about Jesus. He doesn't seem to know which opportunity is going to work out and which one isn't, but he's just waiting for God to show him. It seems so simple in the text, but, but when they asked it to hear him further, you see that in verse 18 through 21, it's an obvious open door to us, right, as we're reading the text. But imagine that you're Paul sitting there in the marketplace. Do you see the language that they use in the text? They make fun of him, right? They're like, hey, uh, scavenger of tidbits. That's not exactly a burn in today's culture, but for him, that would have been, uh, he would have been called like babbler is kind of the equivalent. They, they go, hey, uh, uh, this guy's talking about strange things, so come, come, on, and, come on and talk to us, Right? And so for Paul, like, it's almost like this, they want to hear from me, but it feels like a trap, man. It feels like they're, they're setting me up. There's two groups of people there that we talk about, the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans are kind of like a carpe diem uh, philosophy, this hedonistic philosophy. If, if it feels good, do it, right? And then you've got the Stoics. God is in everything. Accept fate. Don't resist. Just, just live. Sounds familiar, right? You see, these two groups, they, they want him to give a speech. They've already called him these names, and, and, and we know that Paul can anticipate that this is going to be difficult, but, but this is the key. Paul doesn't see this as a hindrance. He sees this as an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Paul knows that he is about to enter a situation that he is going to look like a fool to almost everyone there. It's unlikely that anyone would agree with him. If you do a statistical analysis, a demographic analysis, everyone would say, hey, man, this isn't worth it. You see, for us, we tend to ignore the things that will make us, the opportunities that make us look foolish or weak. We just tell ourselves they're closed doors. But this is not what we're told to do. In fact, we're to anticipate looking foolish when talking about Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 1.27, it says that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame things which are strong. Jesus also helps us anticipate that if we talk about Jesus, we're going to look foolish a lot. He tells us in Luke 9 that one day, if you're going to be classified as following me, it's going to look like dying every day. It goes on to say that if you're ashamed of me in front of people, that one day I will be ashamed of you in front of my heavenly father. You see, Paul takes this opportunity knowing he will look foolish and weak to the crowd, but he does it anyway. 
It reminds me of the prophet Ezekiel, who is tired of the people not listening to him. And God responds by saying, tell them my words, whether they listen or they fail to listen. See, often we avoid hot topics. Why? Because we don't want to look foolish. We don't want to look weak. But in fact, as we learn that it's part of our identity to be viewed by the world as foolish and weak, we're okay with entering into those things where we make much of Jesus. And so we're looking for those kind of opportunities. Number four, as we move quickly. Number four is navigate tensions when speaking. So this is the actual speech itself. So he gets up and finally he has the opportunity to speak to the crowd. So what does that speech look like? Now often when we hear of tension, uh, if you think of tension, if I think of tension, normally it's a, a negative thing, right? Unless you're an engineer in the room, right? Uh, that tension is like, get me out of here, right? Uh, but tension is often a, a wonderful, beautiful thing. In fact, my ability to be so ridiculous with hand motions is partly because uh, of muscular tension uh, in my biceps and triceps, although they're getting smaller uh, as the decades go. Tension as you drive over a bridge, maybe to get here, or maybe you've been frustrated by the the bridge construction on Chipman. Uh, That tension often will hold bridges together as you drive, and it pulls together to keep you upright. Tension is often a great thing. And so today, as we kind of just briefly look at this speech that, that Paul gives, we kind of see the tensions that he's wrestling with as he gives this speech. And as we enter speeches on hot topics, we should wrestle with these same tensions. The temptation is to try to pick some kind of middle ground and say we're at the 25% level or the 76% level. But with tension, it doesn't work like that. We have to be allowed to be pulled by the tensions when we speak. So what's the first tension? We see it there in verse 22 through 24. Paul is observant of the culture, but also direct. Right, so here's the temptation. In verse 22, he's observant. Do you see what he does here? He says, men of Athens, you guys are religious in all respects. He observes how they're acting, what they love, how they're living life. In fact, he goes on to even talk about, I have observed this, this unknown tomb that you guys worship. And so we see him as a student of the culture, a student of them individually. But often when we talk about observing, we just observe. And we never get to being direct, right? That we just always observe and always study and never say anything. This is not what Paul does because he goes to verse 23 and 24. And he goes straight to, hey, what you guys are doing with the whole like idol thing, like those are just like wood, stone, and brick, and they don't really do anything. So like I don't know how that works, right? He's direct. He's pointing out the flaws in how they are living. We must also do both. We must know the people that we're talking to, study them, why they're giving the hearts and affections to things. But we must also be willing to say hard things and say them simply to point out where their worldview doesn't make sense. The next tension that you see, if you're taking notes, you can write these down in in, in the blank spaces. But Paul is relevant, relevant, engaging, but he's also biblical. Look at what he does in verse 28. Paul quotes two Greek poets. The first one is uh, Epimenides, uh, the Cretan, all right? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, He quotes him also in Titus 1.12. And then the second citation is from Eretus. All right, so he quotes two non-believing poets to them because they are familiar with these phrases. Often the temptation is, uh, especially as a a, a student pastor, is I've just got to be relevant. And we we just fall too far on that side of the tension. Like I got to be cool. I I gave up on that a long time ago as I lost some hair and I, you know, all all those things. We, We just try to be cool and say engaging things and attract people. While Paul does do something relevant, he does, uh, he does use something that they will understand. He doesn't just stay on that side of the tension. You see the tension pull him to giving a biblical response as well, that he's not scared to give truth. In fact, his strategy is to talk about the transcendence of God, how we don't compare to him. And then he talks about the cross and the resurrection as payment of sins. And then he talks about the consummation or judgment of the world. The last tension there is bold, but also inviting. You see, he doesn't pull punches here. He calls them ignorant twice. Like, I wouldn't recommend that strategy for you guys, but it seems to work for Paul. But he also calls them to something, right? He's bold. He's willing to say something, but he's also gracious in his call to something. 
You see in verse 27, he's like, God is near to you. Like, this is for you as well. Verse 30, he calls them, repent to this other way of life. And so while he is offensive at times, he's also calling them to something more. He's telling them about their ability to also participate in this life that is more. He's condemning, but he is hopeful. Does this tension pull you as you have conversations? If I had to sum up all of the tensions in one, I would be once again to go back to the character and nature of God. We see in John 1 that Jesus is described as grace and truth in verse 14 and 17. It's not like 25% grace and like 75% truth, but the God man is grace and he is truth. And this should guide us as we engage culture, that we are to be not 25% gracious and 75% truthful or vice versa, but we are to be gracious and to be truthful. This text stems back all the way to the Old Testament. If you thought it was just Jesus, that this is the character and nature of God. Exodus 34, 6, when the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. You see, for us, the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, graciousness, peace, kind, kindness, those things, there's no exemption from those things when you enter into hot topic conversation. It's not a tax exemption to kind of get around and, and fiddle with. There is no exemption that we must display the character and nature of the Spirit. When entering these conversations, we must keep these tensions in mind. And so lastly, lastly, number five, prepare for different responses. I, I think this is, this is so important to see in verse 32 through 34. You see, these people, this group of people in, in the stadium there, they hear the same things. They have the same evidence, but they have massively different responses. And Paul expects that. In fact, in, in 2 Corinthians, he compares it to smell. L let me tell you a story real quick. Uh, you know, uh, I've been known to, but just back in my college days, not, not now, I've been known to, to have some things in my car that smell terrible, right? Uh, it's just, you know, it is what it is. I would have some gym shoes that I'd play basketball in. They'd be in the back seat probably for, what, like six months, you know, that you just what they recommend. And then I'd have like a leftover quick trip, a croissant that was like half eaten, just sit in the, in, in the front car seat, and uh, that gets worse smelling over time. Right? And so what I would do often is I would go and get an air freshener. Right, If I knew I was going to go with a person that would care, all right, I would go get an air freshener from the gas station. I'd put it in. I had to give myself about two hours for it to take effect. Right, And so I'd go get the air freshener, and, and I would drive over to the person's house. And so one time I remember getting an air freshener. I put it in the rearview mirror. And uh, about 30 minutes in, I'm like, oh, man, this stinks. This is, this is awful. It was some kind of like coconutty, like I don't even know what it was, but I was like, this, this smells, this is worse than what it was in the car. And so I'm super nervous. I'm, I'm picking up a, a, a friend. He gets in the car. He's like, wow, this is the greatest smell that I've ever smelled in my entire life. And I'm like, what a commentary on human nature that we could smell the exact same thing and be so far uh, apart. This is the, the illustration that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 2 when he says this in verse 14 and 15 and 16. Thanks be to God who leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ amongst those who are being saved and those who are being perished. To the one, we are the aroma that brings death. To the other, we are the aroma that brings life. Fellow believer, as you interact with the world, as you spread the knowledge of God, know that some are going to smell that like death, avoid it like the plague, and some are going to see life. In fact, here in the text, we see three different responses. We see the persons that sneer, that make fun of him. We see the persons that ask questions like, oh, tell me more. And we see the, the small group that becomes the church there that believes, praise the Lord. We are tempted to think of these three responses as two of them very positive, right, and, and one of them very negative. That two of them, that we have planted a seed that hopefully one day someone will come along and water and grow and the Lord will grow it and he'll do what he, he'll do as we see in Corinthians. And one who believes, wow, what a miracle that someone would believe out of that culture. These are good responses. 
But we see scripturally that the response of sneering, the response of insulting you, the response of being upset is actually not a loss when engaging culture. In fact, we see in Matthew 5, it says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so for us, it's not a two out of three. It's not a, a, a 667 batting average. For us, as we engage the culture with truth, with graciousness and truth, man, it's a 100% batting average that when we're made fun of, praise be to God. When people start to question, praise be to God. When people start to believe, even the heavens rejoice, praise be to God. And so for us, as we look at the example of Paul, in conclusion, as, as the band uh, comes up to play, there's just a question there in your notes. It's a really simple question, hopefully one that's been nagging on your mind throughout. How is God calling you to engage people with the gospel? Maybe for you it's that first step that you're not provoked anymore, and, and you're seeking the Lord to, to help provoke the things of God in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit. Maybe you're provoked too much and you're asking God, man, help me see the right things. Maybe for you, uh, your temptation is to, to isolate yourself and just complain about the culture rather than letting that provoke uh, nature move you towards loving people. Maybe for you, there's just open doors that you've been avoiding in your family, in your workplace because you're going to look foolish. You're going to look weak. And so you've been avoiding them. Maybe it's just taking a step towards that today. Maybe for some of you, it's really balancing some of those tensions in conversation. It's learning how to speak both with grace and with truth. Would you allow the Lord to challenge you in that way? And maybe for some of you that have been rejected many, many times, you feel like nothing's going on in your life, Lord, uh, would you help that person in the room today see your scripture as a promise that as they experience the weight of sin and shame and guilt, Lord, that on the cross that is gone and one day when he returns, he will make all things new and you will have reward for praising the name of Christ among the culture. Lord, I pray that we are a, a people that, that is in the world but not of it, that doesn't love it, that we would love you. And so today as we get ready to sing, we're gonna have a simple response time for you to seek the Lord in one of those areas, uh, to really have a conversation with him. If today is the first time that you're like, man, I, I, I'm in a bad place. Man, I need to come to this Jesus. The way that Paul offers an invitation here, that invitation is to you as well. If you would come and, and repent of your sins, you can have life because of what Christ did on the cross and his resurrection. And so if that's you today, come forward. If today you're just a little bit farther along in the wrestling process, would you just take a moment in your seats as we sing to have a conversation with him. And so let's stand and sing as we have an invitation.